Okay, we're live. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us uh, with the Columbia Omni Studios uh, interview uh, series for uh, textile experts. And we have a very fine expert today. Uh, he's a friend of mine, Miguel uh, Ortiz de Zavalios. Uh, and he is the, um, the head uh, technical director uh, of a mill in Lima, Peru. And um, it's a very fine mill. They make uh, first quality goods. And I just thought it would be really interesting for us to hear, um, you know, about COVID. How, how has it affected the mills? Um, how has it affected the, that other side of the business that we always talk about, but we never talk uh, to, uh, at least not on this, on this uh, venue. Um, so I thought it would be a great idea to, to, to talk to Miguel. And, um, just ask them some questions. Um, there's a, a, a way to, on Facebook to, um, to ask questions if you'd like, um, and we will, we will do that. So uh, without further ado, I, I present to you Miguel Ortiz de Zavalios. Hello, Mitch. Good Hi, afternoon Miguel. with you and everybody else. You know, I just want to say, guys, we're having a little bit of uh, bandwidth issues between Peru and here. Um, we might have to turn off the video. It might be a little glitchy uh, with the audio. Um, and, if it, and if it is, please bear with us. Uh, but we, we'll try a few things along the way. But um, bear with us. It might be a little bit glitchy, but uh, I, I think well worth it. So, Miguel, how are you, sir? Glad, glad to be here. Thank you very much for this invitation. I'm very proud of Abney Studio in this interview. Looking forward to talk about textiles with you. Yeah, well, we've been talking uh, textiles for uh, many, many years. Um, just uh, just for, for background, Miguel and I went to the Philadelphia College of Textiles and Sciences way back in the Ice Age. And um, to give you a, a, an idea of, of how textiles is doing in this country, it's not Philadelphia College of Textiles and Sciences anymore. It's, uh, it was Philadelphia College, and now uh, it's Jefferson University, uh, with uh, a, still a textile program, but a smaller one uh, than they had. Um, well, tell us a little bit about Credit Tex, Miguel. What kind of mill is it? Uh, what do you produce? What do you sell? What stays internal? and um, what kind of goods do you sell on the outside? Thank you, Mitch. I will start by mentioning to your audience that Peru is a textile hub in Latin America, not because huge productions, but because of the high quality. We have top quality cotton, we have Pima, extra long staple, and also we have the Tanguis, which is a very high quality long staple cotton. But also we have very good uh, craftsmanship. So actually we have very high, highly qualified labor that uh, ensures us that we can produce goods of uh, oriented for the top niche market. And in, in that sense, Peruvian textile industry has positioned over the last 20 years in, in, in that niche of the market, making high-end products. With that regards, we at are, we are Creditex, we are one of the biggest textile companies in Peru. And I say biggest companies, probably not because of the bigger volume, but because we are the most vertically integrated company. That means that we have different processes. We actually are operating seven different plants and we are uh, coordinating and processing the fibers since we buy them. Our vertical integration has several different areas. We do the first process that we do is a ginning process. In process, we operate two gins, 
where we separate the cotton seed from the fiber and actually make the bales. We all, <clears throat> the bales that we source locally in Peru, we classify them in a similar way as the USDA classifies American cotton using the HVI instrument in order to get the same values in order to later on plan our layouts in the blends that we produce in the mills. Besides from ginning, we are very big in spinning. We are spinning at the moment with almost 100,000 spindles. That's a lot. And we are producing around 800 tons of yarn per month, consuming almost 1,000 tons of raw material, mainly cotton. Also, I must say, we are probably at the moment the finest spinner in the continent. Besides from spinning, then we have our next business unit, which is fabric forming. We have a textile plant where we convert the yarns into fabrics. We do yarn dyeing, we do piece dyeing, also we do printing. So in the textile plant, we have the weaving area, the yarn dyeing, the, the piece dyeing, the printing, and the finishing of the fabrics. That gives birth to our second business unit, which sells fabric. The first business unit sells yarn. The second sells fabrics. We sell fabric to companies <clears throat> mainly in Latin America and in Central America, we sell a lot of shirting fabrics, fabrics for pants, for apparel, but we are also selling some home textiles and printed fabrics uh, directly to the US. <clears throat> but that's not all. Besides our weaving <laughs> and finishing, we have also apparel manufacturing, where we are operating two plants with almost about 2,000 at the moment. In one of the plants, we have a capacity of manufacturing shirts of about 80 shirts per month. And then we have a second plant where we are doing pants, doing between 35,000 to 40,000 pants per month in that plant. And in both of these plants, we are working mainly for American brands. We are doing goods for Tommy Bahamas, for Johnson & Murphy, for L.L. Bean, for Cabela's, for, for many um, American brands, we are doing their products. Uh, many of these goods, besides of being manufactured, nowadays they need some kind of wash, either some softening or some uh, type of laundry effect into the garment. So we actually have a laundry with our own operation and we are doing all the laundry and the garment dyeing process here as well. So that's uh, our third business unit, which is selling apparel to brands internationally. Uh, finally, we have a fourth business unit, which is operating locally in only in Peru, but that is the only business format that is working on a business to consumer, it's a B2C. All the previous business units I mentioned were on a B2B, we are selling to, a, to another company. On the retail business units, we are having direct cust uh, contact with the customer and we are selling to people either online or through our stores. We are operating four different brands uh, segmented in different niches of the market and we run 16 stores through Peru in Lima. So that is mainly how we are organized and the vertical structure of the company. It's a little bit glitchy, uh, Miguel, right now, but um, thank you very much. That's a great, um, great explanation. And uh, it is really quite a mill. 
um, I was really surprised when I went down there um, to see a uh, spinning of 50 singles yarn, uh, 100 two ply, uh, really fine, fine yarns, um, which you couldn't do um, unless the, the yarn had a very long staple like a Pima, Pima cotton. I, uh, thank you for that explanation, Miguel. I was telling the audience that um, it really is a fine mill that, and, and that I had been lucky enough to go there too. Um, and that you spin fine, fine yarns of like 50 singles and a hundreds two ply, um, which I, I've never seen before on a spinning frame. Um, what, what do you do as a technical director? I, it's, it almost sounds like that title's not big enough for what you do because I know uh, all that you're involved in. Uh, but tell the audience what, uh, what you do as a technical director. As a technical director, besides of the responsibilities and decisions of top management, it is under my responsibility, the spinning operations, the weaving operations, and all the wet processing and dyeing and finishing operations in the company. The apparel manufacturing and the gin, and there are some other people from our staff who are directly responsible for those operations. So I will be in charge of all the transmitting up operations, which is about 1,400 people and four plants under my responsibility, Mitch. Also, also one of the most important things is that I am in charge and I lead the product development group and the new products team. And how do you how do you how do you shop the market to to find out what's new what's coming up? We are looking at the market and participating in shows, but it is mainly through our commercial area that we see that our customers bring to us their requirements. We see from them. The, in, in first hand, what they see the market is going to be bringing us for the next season. They are permanently challenging us to do new finishes, to do new blends, to come up with new fabrics in order to have something new to present to the market. Also, nowadays, we see that the brands and the market is challenging us, the manufacturers, with the sustainability issues. And before the pandemic, we had a beautiful plant to show. We had customers that were visiting the, the company and visiting our plants, and we were able to show them firsthand here in Peru our sustainability and the reasons that we are sustainable, how we take care of environment, how we take care of our people. Nowadays, in the new reality, we are having no visitors. So we have to prepare a way where we can present and show this to our customers and to the consumers. So I know that uh, Peru has had a hard time with COVID. 19, um, it's uh, been one of the worst countries hit. How did, how did it affect your business and how does it continue to affect your business? Oh yes, indeed, Mitch, and very much. Uh, COVID has hit Peru very hard. And what we have seen is that being a country that is, is a poor country, our health infrastructure was not enough. So actually it was very rapidly uh, collapsed because all the resources were being occupied in the hospitals. Uh, this has uh, meant that Peru is having one of the worst numbers uh, globally in, in, with regards to COVID. And yes, we have to be very, very careful. In that regard, we had to 
implement very strict sanitary protocols. Uh, also, we had to implement a very strong uh, campaign in order to motivate the people and to motivate our people to understand that they have to protect themselves because the Latin cultures are very friendly. So people in South America, it's very common that they hug and they kiss each other a lot. So actually we had to uh, make the people very conscious, very aware of all the uh, risks that they had. We were very early manufacturing face masks and also protective gear. We have distributed that gear among our personnel. We are testing our personnel permanently and we are implementing uh, very strict uh, sanitary protocols with regards to our people coming into work and moving from the mills to their homes. We are transporting people, avoiding them using the public transportation. But still, uh, I would say that by now, probably we have around 30 to 40% of the population of the mill that has already had COVID and is back working after COVID. Wow. wow. Yes, very tough. And you were, you were closed for a while? We were closed for a little while between uh, mid-March until mid-April. In mid-April, we uh, got a government authorization that allowed us to start working partially in order to uh, manufacture uh, protection uh, elements for the country and for the government. As up to now, we have probably manufactured more than a million of face masks for the local government. Wow. Wow. But that has helped because it has allowed us to do some production in the months where we had very little production or little orders. No? Yeah. So the, the, it's, it has been, I would say, a win-win situation where the local government as, uh, as, the, as the textile companies, the local textile companies, to quickly respond to many different requirements that they had for products for, for health and safety. Uh, so we have been, uh, many of us, doing so in the last two or three months. How has, how has COVID affected your relationships with your customers? I mean, were there, were there orders canceled? Were there, you know, rush, rush demands? Were, you know, what, what did that look like? In, in, in that regards, uh, we have seen many different things. Fortunately for us, with regards to the orders that were pending, we have had very little cancellations. We have very strong and good relations with our customers. Most of the times the customers might have reduced the amount of the order or in some other cases asked us to delay the shipment or the, of the order until their, until their stocks would, uh, would go down a little bit more. But uh, fortunately for us, uh, we haven't had many cancellations. What we do see is that the projections for the rest of the year and for the first quarter of next year are probably at 50% of what were normal, regular projections. We, in that sense, Mitch, we are present in different markets. For example, the products that we produce are flat wovens, are, are, are woven fabrics and shirts and pants. 
But nowadays, those are not the, the most ideal products. People are consuming other kinds of products. Yeah. People are consuming loungewear, sleepwear, products that are for a more relaxed uh, environment as people are now more staying at home. So actually we see, for example, that our yarn business unit that uh, supplies other companies that mainly do knits, that business unit has recuperated faster. And today we are already working the spinning business unit at 85% of the capacity. On the other side, the weaving and the apparel manufacturing uh, infrastructure is, is, is recovering much slower because those kind of products are in much less demand in this new reality in the market. So we, 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 don't, we haven't seen, I would say, maybe one of our customers that is, is closing uh, and, and, and shutting down the business, but all of the others have reinvented themselves and they have new projections that we will have to live with for the next few months. On my personal opinion, the, uh, the flood wovens and the apparel business is going to change for good. And probably the markets will not be the same as we were used to uh, before, mainly because the consumers are changing. So men's shirting go, will go the way of men's suitings. I'm afraid so. I'm afraid so. Huh. And also, one of the things that is going to be very important is how we are going to be trading. How are we going to be selling? I was mentioning to you before that we have that we have uh, many customers visiting us in the country and coming to creditors. We also had commercial teams that used to travel. We had up to four different teams traveling two or three times a year, visiting our customers on the East Coast, on the West Coast, Central, and Central America and Mexico, South America as well. Nowadays, we have no trips. So actually, all the sales will have to be performed either through the virtual trade shows or through conferences and webin not webinars, but actually direct conversations and the ones that we're having now. Samples would be, have to be shipped by uh, UPS or by FedEx, whatever, but still it is difficult to maintain the relationship with a customer. And it is not the same as when you actually make a visit and you come, you have come to Creditex and you have seen our company and I have personally shown you the, the advantages of working with us. And I, you, you sure know that that sells a lot and it makes a very big impact in the customer because it builds sure. trust. Once you come and you see how we do things, how clean the meal is, you see the products, you see the procedures that we have implemented in our processes, then you start gaining trust. How do you assess business going forward now? Um, you know, do you try and not take too big of a, um, a risk with, a, with an order? Or do you try and keep the order smaller and more manageable? How do you manage that? Uh, it's, the things, the, I would say that the orders are coming smaller by nature. Nowadays, none of the customers is willing to put big programs. The only big programs that we see at the moment are the programs that we're working locally for the public institutions. The programs that we are running for the health department and so on. But for the exports and for our regular export customers, we understand 
that at the moment, the orders would reduce into smaller runs. Also, they are going to need more versatility. I think that one of the uh, opportunities that we mills, American mills have nowadays is that probably many brands will are going to shift away from China. When they shift away from China, we will probably be an option because our lead times and our shipping times are much shorter than from mainline China. So actually, and the amount of inventory in the supply chain. Right, they can order more uh, for need rather than taking it and putting it on the shelf. They'll have you, you sit with it on the shelf. We, we're working in, in, in with uh, regards of being very uh, agile in order to make lean production and being just on time in order for uh, doing replenishments for the customers. So the initial orders do, do not have to be so big. And there's a, a free trade agreement with Peru and the United States, correct? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And that should help you. Peruvian textile products access the U.S. Uh, market uh, without tariffs. That should help you in um, combating China. Yes, very much. Very much. So you touched on sustainability before. What, what are you doing for sustainability? Why is it important? Uh, do you you think it's an ongoing thing or is it a short-lived uh, interest level or that it'll continue? Uh, we take sustainability very seriously, Mitch. I, we think it is very important because uh, the earth is warming up and the climate is changing and we have more hurricanes every season. So we as a world have to be conscious that we need to do something more proactively. And with that regards, we are conscious that the consumers are more and more aware and understand the value of sustainability. Not only with regards to environmental impact, but with regards to social impact as well. So we uh, are very responsible with regards to the way we treat our workers, our people, and how we treat the environment. We, we think that more than doing additional things, what we have to do is we have to be better at marketing and letting the customers and the market know why we are sustainable and why we have a transparent way of uh, doing production. One, some of the examples that we are doing at the moment is, for example, we are measuring our environmental impact we will probably have that finished by December, by December this year. So we will be measuring the greenhouse gases emissions that we are uh, putting into the atmosphere at the moment. Also, we are doing the uh, water uh, footprint in order to see how much water per kilo of production we are consuming, looking at how we can optimize these values, then we will probably be implementing projects for optimization. But our, our main objective is to become net zero in carbon emissions. 
So at the end of this process, once we have how many CO2 emissions we are uh, putting into the atmosphere, our plan is to buy locally from the Amazon, from several projects that we have in the Amazon, carbon certificates. Buying these carbon certificates, we will be neutralizing our emissions and reaching a net zero emission state, which would be lovely to get there. At the moment, we are trying well, to figure out if this process is going to take us several months or maybe more in order to put a deadline to the project. As I mentioned before, nowadays we have to show that we are sustainable and document that we are sustainable to our customers. Not only we will have to present virtually our products, but also we will have to be able to present virtually all these uh, actions that we are doing for uh, the customers and uh, the final users of the products to have the, the opportunity to do all the traceability of the product and find a nice story at the end of the line. So you don't think uh, sustainability issues are, are going away? No, not at all, not at all. But I think that for example, one of the other things that sustainability is going to evolve is with regards to the circular economy. We see, I, I do travel a lot, and I see today that in Europe, for example, the garments and the brands are looking that the garments will have a second life cycle. So they will have a first user and then they will go to a recycling uh, center and then they will have a second user before being disposed. Uh, we have seen in the last years that the society has been very much consuming products and consuming them at a very fast pace. And the fashion has not helped in that sense. And in order for the manufacturers, in order to keep in pace with that fast fashion, they had to lower down the costs of the products. And down the cost of the product, one of the things that has happened is that the quality of the product has been reduced. You probably will not notice when you see a product on the shelf and the, at a store brand new. But what is for sure is that the lifetime of that product is much, much less. I have some shirts, for example, that have lasted uh, for me a year but I have other shirts that have lasted me four years. <laughs> in, in the example that I am putting, one product has a life cycle four times longer to be replaced in a fourth uh, uh, and then the other product. So actually generates less waste. Uh, it, it's not good business for the brands, but it's good business for the planet. I think that with regards to circular economy, we still have a long way to go, but it will be one of the pillars of sustainability as well. Yeah. I mean, if it's part of your, 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 your business and your, your business image out to the market, um, like a company like Patagonia, they make something that, you know, is supposed to last forever. And if it doesn't last forever, you know, send it in and we'll fix it, make it, uh, make sure that it lasts forever. Hasn't hurt their business at all. So it, it can be done. Yes, indeed. Many companies like Patagonia, I think that's the way to go. Hopefully many more brands 
will flood past. Okay, I'm going to change things up a little bit um, and ask you some questions regarding color. Uh, th this started out as yes. really like kind of a color uh, management type of um, series, but it's branched off into other textile stuff. Um, but as far as color, you know, to, we, we haven't had a chance to talk directly to a mill. And I was wondering if you... Um, have you gotten involved at all with uh, certifying? Has your mill been certified so you can uh, self-approve colors? Um, or is it still traditional, you know, dye the color in the lab, send it in to uh, submit and, and, and wait for their approval? Being Mitch, being present in different markets with different business units means that we are working with probably a customer list of over a hundred customers. And of those customers, not all of them have the same technological level or are in a similar fashion updated. So sure. actually my answer to your question would be that we have a mix. We at Creditex have one, two, three, four spectrophotometers plus a fifth one, which is a portable for, for spectrophotometers. So actually we have five different instruments measuring color. Besides those five instruments, we probably have around six or seven light boxes with all the different standard illuminants to look at the colors in the proper way. You know about that. Uh, but actually we see customers the light to look at the colors visually. We see some customers that are looking at the colors instrumentally by color coordinates. And we see some customers that are looking at colors in a combined way, instrumentally and visually. Besides that, as we at Creditex being vertical, we have many different teams looking at colors. One of the main tasks that I had to do was to standardize the way that we look at colors. So what I did at that time is I brought somebody that you also know, Mr. Renzo Shami. He's a, a, a professor, a member of the faculty at NC State. And we brought him two times for a week each to do a color consultancy. Here, he told us the theory about color and he evaluated our procedures on how we look at color in order to standardize our procedures. So our different teams will be looking at color in a similar way. Once we had that, established and all that we had a trans, uh, it was a horizontal uh, quality assurance of the way that we looked at colors we started working with our customers we have some american customers that have decided as a policy that all their color approvals will be done automatically with spectrophotometers and actually we have a tolerance of color. And after the color has been read, we send the sample. Also one of the is that to be looking at colors virtually because all the trade shows are gonna be digital. So what is going to happen at that time? The colors are gonna, the calibration of the, of the screens is going to have a very big role. And also, I have another issue about color, and I, think it, and I think it's quite a challenging one. And the last time I was at the AATCC conference, I brought up this matter because I think there is a committee that is looking particularly to this, uh, to this subject, which is the new illuminance for 30 years we have been looking at colors with the standard illuminants, the F35, the D65. But nowadays, the new technology of the LED illuminants 
make the lights can change the way they are emitting light. So actually you have a, a light bulb that can be emitting certain length waves now and different length waves of light five minutes later and you will have the same illuminant in the possibility of uh, emitting a cold light or light. Already changed their illuminants to lead. And they did, so they had to do it right away. But we as the D65. So I was, I was talking with my customers and looking at the colors under D65 light, and the customers were looking at the garments under LED lights that uh, <laughs> brought different colors. Right. Those are challenges that uh, that the industry will have <laughs> to face in the next, in, in, in not so long. Yeah, it's, you know, it, that's a that's a constant battle, um, you know, just getting people to look under D65, which is like, you know, plain vanilla is, is tough sometimes. And, um, you know, and then UL30 and TL84, those, every one of those were a battle. So um, it'll continue. And then halogen lights too will be, you know, something. So has, for the customers that you do um, self-approvals for, has it affected your relationship with those um, retailers or brands? Is it, um, is it a smoother um, flow of, of business? Yes, I would, I would have to mention, I would have to agree with you. Yes, it, it makes it smoother. I, 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 I didn't mention an additional thing that it's important to consider. Besides that some customers are looking at colors instrumentally and some other customers are looking at colors visually, some customers rely their color approval on us because we have been their supplier for many seasons now and they trust Creditex and they know that we have implemented quality assurance procedures that are very strict and that we will not be moving off their standards. Some other brands have agents named in Peru. So it is actually part of the role of the agent approving the colors. That makes it a little bit easier than sending the samples to the customer to the US, for example. But we still have some customers or maybe some new customers where we are just starting to those cases, they prefer to do their own approvals. What is what I reply to them on those cases? Of course, you have all the right to approve the colors yourselves, but bear in mind that then the color approval procedure will probably be adding four or five days to the lead time because we have to send the samples to the US. And nowadays, one of the things that is happening with the crisis is that the FedEx packages and the DHL packages are taking twice as long as they regularly do. Yeah, so actually know. it is adding more, more days, no? So I, actually I think it is a process. In a similar way, it's happening with testing. We at Creditex have a full lab we do almost all the AATCC and many of the ASTM tests, but we have not accredited our lab officially, but still we do all the norms and the procedures in a similar way. When we start working with a customer, he's always asking for third party testing. But after a while, when, he, when we start presenting them our own internal test results, he says, hey, wait a minute, we're losing money and we're losing time here. <laughs> uh, let's, let's do some correlation of your testing with a third party testing. And if that correlation is strong, next season we start working with your testing. And then right. he saves time and I save money. 
That's interesting. I always thought about, you know, I always think about color and self approvals, but I never really thought about the lab work uh, that could be done also in a, in a self approval way. That's neat. Finally, it is a matter of trust. So doing business uh, during, during COVID, have, have you changed anything um, in your workflow that um, you can now say, you know, we, we learned how it's more efficient and it's, it'll, it'll be a best practice even after COVID? Has there anything been learned that way? It has been a learning experience, Mitch. It really has. <laughs> sure. And we have reviewed many things. There was a point in time a few weeks ago during applying as a standard procedure antibacterial finishes to the fabric because we were not sure how long did the COVID uh, virus uh, would live on top of the textiles. We have done some also uh, trials with products that are not antibacterial but antiviral with very good results indeed, but that, that adds on into the fabric cost, probably 50 to 60 cents a yard. So actually it is, it is something to be, to be considered. No? We have also reviewed uh, all the procedures that we have with all our personnel that is in contact with the fabric in all the final stages, no? but mainly, uh, I think that one of the things that has changed about the, the, uh, the COVID crisis, and, and this is really going to change, is how we consume. I think that the consumer is changing, the consumer behavior is changing, the retail is changing, and that is forcing also the way to business to business. Is changing. I'm looking forward. I really don't have that high expectations on the virtual shows. They are going to be a, a necessity. We have to go through the virtual shows. But I am not sure if, uh, I don't know, whenever you are, when you are buying textiles, you used to like to see the drape, feel the hand, even smell the fabric, no? <laughs> Doing all that virtually, I think it is going to be very difficult. I think that we might get to a mixture, a, a new, I don't know, maybe part of it will go digital on the virtual shows and maybe we will start traveling sometime soon again or we will be always sending samples. But what is the point in sending sales samples when there are going to be no sales shows. We rather send digital samples in, no? Yeah. Yeah. It would be interesting if you can invite it in some other of these uh, talks to some uh, members of the, of the other end of the, uh, of the chain, maybe some of the brands and retailers to see what are their expectations or what they think they should be doing. Yeah. Or what they They're think the what we should be doing. Yeah. That was, that's what I was going to ask next was, what do you think will change with the retailers or, or the brands? What, have, what from COVID did they learn? You, you talked before about smaller orders, um, just-in-time manufacturing. What else do you think um, would change in their in their world? I, th I think they have to turn and, and look at the consumers because the 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 engine that is going to change this movement is going to be the consumers. People from our generation, Mitch, are getting to the top of the of the of the, of the pyramid. So what we're each. <laughs> week or month that passes, we are less. And the broader part of the pyramid is the younger generations and they're more and more, more of them are being consumers. 
I think that the, as consumers, the issue of the traceability of the product, being able to scan a tag in a shirt or in a, yeah, and, and looking where it comes from, seeing if uh, the origin of the raw materials or, or and I think that we really didn't care much about that before. Nowadays, the consumers do care and they find value on, on, on those kind of things. And I think that is important. Uh, it would be interesting, for example, to ask students, high school or college students, where do they find value? My, my, my perfect example is that talking about a, a product for the future or a sustainable product is that we i argue with our commercial people please give me a sustainable product and i tell them okay i can give you a t-shirt that i will be doing with 50 percent recycled fiber then you will have a product that will have very strong sustainable message written in the product but probably that product will have a life cycle that would be a third or a fourth of a product that has been done with virgin fiber and combed yarns in that sense the product will not have such a strong sustainable message in the product but the story the product will have behind and the life cycle of the product on my opinion, will probably make it much more sustainable in a serious way than the previous one. That's right. my personal opinion. No? Yeah, no, that makes that makes complete sense, and I can understand why uh, that would be difficult to um, to educate the consumer about what is what what it truly is the sustainability. So, what? Here's my last question to you, Miguel. And um, what do you what do you love most about your job? Mitch, by far, product development. Yeah, I'm a yeah. passionate of my of of my career and of being a textile engineer, and I really, I do the things that I have to do because they are part of my job. But I what I really live for is doing the products where we actually tailor the products since the, since the twist of the yarn that we put in and spinning. Sometimes we do that. Sometimes we adjust all the different parameters of the product or the functional finishes. And when we are evaluating how this functional finish perform, we're seeing different fabric constructions or we are developing new blends or looking at stretch fabrics or now be directional stretch asking the fabrics to stretch in the warp direction and doing all those kinds of things and seeing the products from the cradle, starting from the cradle and going all the process and getting into the market and then being into the shelves in the market, I think it's a wonderful experience. And having uh, the, uh, the opportunity to, of working with a team of different professionals and imagining products and then later on, seeing them become a reality is uh, something that really me. Yeah, that would be pretty gratifying. So Miguel, I think, I think that's it. I think uh, you've answered these questions in a, in a great, great positive way. Um, if you have any questions, um, after this, uh, and you'd like to send me the questions, I could send them to Miguel. Um, if there's things that you're interested in talking to uh, Miguel and Credit Tax about uh, supplying uh, X goods, um, I'm, cert I'm certain that they would be uh, welcoming that conversation. And uh, if there's anything that I could do for you at uh, Columbia Omni, uh, please uh, give us a call and um, I'd love to help you guys out. So that's about it. And uh, thank you very much, everybody, and have a great, great night.